Now just imagine, seven o'clock this morning, your alarm rings, and it switches the radio on. Good morning, seven o'clock, time for the seven o'clock news. Good morning to the Russian state of England. You wonder what on earth has happened. You were told that during the night, the Russians invaded and have taken over the whole of England. Not Wales, not Scotland, just England. They're fed up with the bad government in England, so they have come to sort us all out. And they have brought their army in, so there are soldiers in every town, there are governors in every city, and they have brought their army in so we have got to pay taxes to them. On top of all our other taxes, we've got to pay taxes to them of three million rubles a year just for the privilege of being alive and under their control. Every person who doesn't... Um, well, every person, it doesn't matter how rich or poor you are, you must pay your three million rubles. Anybody... Refusing to pay will be dispatched in the usual way. Well, you're not well pleased. Not the best experience on a Sunday morning when your alarm rings. But this is what happened to Judea when the Lord Jesus Christ was a boy there. When he was about 10 years old. He lived up in Galilee. They were all right. It just happened in Judea. Archelaus had been ruling Judea for about 10 years. He was after Herod the Great. They divided uh, the country up and Archelaus was ruling in Judea. But he was such an outstanding failure that the Romans felt they had to go in and sort things out. So that's just what they did. And they made Judea a Roman province, and they had a census, and they counted everybody. And when they knew everybody, all the girls from 12 upwards, all the boys from 14 upwards, they then taxed them, one denarius each. It didn't matter how much you earned, you paid your tax, or you paid for it with your life. And this didn't go down very well. Judas, the Gaulanite, led a rebellion. Taxation is the beginning of slavery, he cried. He said, if we pay taxes to Rome, we're really slaves of Rome, and we mustn't be slaves of anybody. We're the people of God, so we don't pay taxes. If you pay taxes, then you're a slave of Rome. Judas was crucified, and so were many of his followers. But... His rallying cry, his battle cry, didn't die out. Deep in the people's hearts, many felt the same as Judas. If we pay taxes to Rome, then we're not slaves of God anymore. We're slaves of Rome. And we shouldn't be slaves of Rome if we're the servants of God. So the Sanhedrin thought of a cunning plot. This is how they would catch Jesus in his words. So they went to Jesus. They sent a group to Jesus and, and they said, um, if they could get Jesus to say, don't pay taxes to Caesar, then they just needed to have a little whisper in Pontius Pilate's ear and Jesus would disappear. Well, actually, he would be dealt with ruthlessly. But if Jesus wouldn't say pay taxes, uh, sorry, if he wouldn't say don't pay taxes, if he would say, oh no, we, we're not to pay taxes to Rome, we're the people of God. If he wouldn't say that, if he said no, pay your taxes, then he would lose the love of loyal Jews. And his <laughs> movement, they thought, would die out. So they thought they had him. They thought they couldn't lose, but they were in for another very big shock. We see there in verse 13 that they sent a delegation of Pharisees and Herodians to Jesus. Now, the Pharisees were the religious right. They were the influential pressure group. They were the fundamentalists. They were the moral conscience of Israel. And they had an awful lot of power. They were like... Um, you know, powerful journalists who, if you, if you disagreed with them, well, they would make sure that the whole country turned against you. 
Pharisees. And with them, we read, were some Herodians. Well, we, honestly, we don't know much about who the Herodians were. We know very little about them, but it seems as if they were a bit like the secret police. You know, they had that contact with Herod. They had the ear of the king. Well, they went to Jesus, and in verse 14, they tried to butter him up. They said all the nice things. I mean, it's amazing how true they, the, it was, but they were saying it in a way to put Jesus under emotional pressure so that if he didn't answer their question, it would look as if he was a coward who was afraid to answer. They said to him, Teacher, we know that you are a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by men because you pay no attention to who they are, but you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You can see how they were putting him under emotional pressure that he had to give a reply. They thought, they're going to get him now. And then in verse 15, they ask the catch question. Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? And Jesus' answer is in three parts. First of all, in the beginning of verse 15, he confronts them with their hypocrisy. Secondly... The end of verse 15 and the beginning of verse 16, he asks them about the coin that they pay the uh, Roman tax with. He asks them to show him a denarius. And then thirdly, he gives a one-sentence soundbite answer. Give to God what belongs to God. Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. And R. Kent Hughes says in his commentary that this sentence, give to Caesar what is due to Caesar and give to God what is due to God, that sentence is universally acclaimed to be the single most influential political statement ever made in the history of the world. Well, that's quite a statement, quite a claim about a statement. Isn't it? So let us look carefully at Jesus' statement. And first of all, we're going to look at the wrong worldview that uh, caused this question to be asked. The, the delegation who came along, their worldview was wrong. We shall look at that worldview. Then we shall look at a common misunderstanding. People who hear Jesus' reply often misunderstand it. And then thirdly, we shall look carefully at what Jesus actually said. And why he said it using a denarius in his answer. So first of all then, let's look at the wrong worldview about God and Caesar. How big do you think the Roman Empire was? I mean, how do you measure how big the Roman Empire was? How did Caesar measure how big his empire was? I'll tell you, Caesar measured the size of his empire by seeing where Roman coins were being used. So if they used Roman coins in Judea, then Judea was now part of the Roman Empire. If they didn't use Roman coins in Judea, then they were still in rebellion against Caesar's rule and they were not a part of his control. So Caesar was very keen to have the people in Judea using Roman coins. And the zealous Jews in Judea were very adamant that they weren't going to use Roman coins. They weren't going to admit to being subjects of Caesar. So if you wanted to buy an animal, a lamb, to sacrifice in the temple, you would go to the temple and you would take your coin and then you would have to change it into the currency of the Judeans, which didn't have a picture of Caesar on it, just had a picture of the temple on it or something. And you would have to use their coins before you could buy the sacrifices to use in the temple. You couldn't use Caesar's coins because that was giving the impression you were under the authority of Caesar. Now, Caesar insisted that when you paid the poll tax, the census, as it was called, it's where we get the word census from, you count the people in the census and then you uh, tax them with the census. Caesar insisted that when you pay 
the, the poll tax, you pay it with the Roman coins, the Roman denarius, as a sign that you are in subjection to the authority of Caesar. So the coins were very important. Which coins you used showed whose authority you were under. So all this meant that the zealous Jewish uh, young men would not pay the Roman tax if they possibly could avoid it. Because that meant they were part of Caesar's empire. And they thought if they were part of Caesar's empire, then they weren't in God's empire. They were under Caesar's authority, so they weren't under God's authority. It was as simple as that. You can't be in two camps. You can't have your foot in one boat and the other boat. So get out of Caesar's camp and get into God's camp. Don't pay your taxes to Caesar. Just pay your temple taxes. And you know what? Even today, we have some keen Christians around who believe very similar things to this. They seem to hold a similar worldview as this. I have read books by them, and um, when I was minister of the church in Chesterfield, there were quite a few people in the congregation who held this view. You know, if you were in God's kingdom, then you should have nothing to do with the kingdoms of this world. And I'm sure that in a congregation this size, there are some people who hold that view as well. So I ask you to listen to me patiently. Well, actually, these friends of mine uh, up in the Midlands, they wouldn't go quite as far as the Jewish zealots here in first century uh, Judea. My friends would pay their taxes. At least, I think they would pay them most of the time. However, they felt that we should have no other involvement in politics at all. So, in my naivety, I was asked if we could use the church hall for a polling station for the election. And I said, yeah, of course you can. I want to be part of the community. And then they said, well, could we use it as a polling station for three different wards? So we'll have three rooms for uh, uh, electing, casting your ballots in. And I said, yeah, of course you can. And they said, well, can we use it in the evening to count the votes of all the whole area? I said, yes, of course we can. And then I got some letters from members of the church who were horrified. And they told me in no uncertain terms that a soldier of Christ should not be involved in civilian affairs. And they actually gave me the chapter in verse in 2 Timothy. They said that as Christians we shouldn't be involved in civilian affairs. But these people who wrote me these letters, they were shopkeepers. And I thought that was civilian affairs. School teachers. I thought that was civilian affairs. But they said, oh no, we can do that, we just can't vote. And you certainly can't become a politician. No, they said. They even told me that we should pray for our politicians, but not pray for their conversion. Only pray that they rule justly so that we can live in peace. Because you shouldn't be a politician if you were a Christian. They said you can pray for the government, but you can't vote for it. God chooses the government. That's up to him. Leave it up to him. As Christians, pray about it, but don't vote. Well, I agree that God raises up governments and he gives countries the governments he wants them to have that they deserve. But I also believe that God chooses who's going to be saved. And therefore we pray for those people, don't we? But we also evangelize them, we also witness to them, we also do everything we can to reach them. We believe in the sovereignty of God, we also believe in human responsibility. And actually, as I explained to these people, if you don't vote in the ballot box, then you voted with your feet. You've still voted, haven't you? It's just that you've weakened the strong party and strengthened the bad. You, you weakened the good parties and strengthened the bad parties. Indeed, um, throughout history, God has raised up godly politicians, not only among his people like Moses and Solomon and Deborah, but God has raised up uh, godly uh, government officials in pagan empires. We think of Joseph, we think of Daniel, we think of Nehemiah, we think of Esther. And personally, I thank God for those have, who have fought for justice in our country. I thank God for people like William Wilberforce, 
and Lord Shaftesbury. And I only wish we had more. And I pray that we will have more. And I want more Christians in government. I want Christians not only in, as school governors, but as lo in local government and in the whole government. I only wish we had more. And so you will see that I totally reject the worldview of the Pharisees, which says, says if you are under God's authority, then you shouldn't be under the authority of uh, a hostile state. You pay taxes to God, you don't pay taxes to Caesar. If you pay taxes to Caesar, you're disloyal to God. You've got to choose one or the other, but you can't have both. That was the worldview of the um, Sanhedrin that sent those people to test Jesus Christ. Secondly, we have Jesus' reply, render to Caesar what is due to Caesar and to God what is due to God, and that is often misunderstood. So let's look at this misunderstanding of Jesus' reply, because some people think that when Jesus said, render to Caesar what is due to Caesar and render to God what is due to God, they said that there are these two kingdoms. One is secular, we render to Caesar what is due to Caesar, and one is spiritual, we render to God what is due to God. And that we have to know how to behave uh, relating to both kingdoms. We, now ha we need to know as Christians how to relate in the spiritual, uh, secular kingdom, and how to relate in the spiritual kingdom. So here's Caesar's kingdom, and in Caesar's kingdom we behave in a certain way, and here's God's kingdom, and in God's kingdom we behave in a stiff, special way. And we've got to keep these two kingdoms separate. That's what people think Jesus is saying. Give to Caesar what is due to Caesar, give to God what is due to God. I was horrified. I think it must have been 10, maybe even 15 years ago. I was at a meeting and I was the second speaker. There was one speaker before me, and then there was me. And the first speaker got up, and he said that we have to keep our lives in two compartments. We have our, our, our secular world, and we have our spiritual world, and we've got to keep them separate. Well, I was horrified. Then I spoke afterwards, and he was horrified. And the funny thing is, I didn't complain about him, but he complained about me to the uh, people who had organized the meeting. But there's this age-old theory that some things are spiritual and other things are secular. So if you are spiritual, you become a missionary. That's a spiritual thing to do. But if you're a banker, well, that's secular. That's not spiritual. And some people think that Jesus was saying, you must make a separation between the secular and the spiritual. Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, but give to God what belongs to God. And don't muddle them up. So it's not only church and state that must be kept separate, but don't bring spiritual things into your job either. Keep your job separate. And don't bring secular things into the church either. Keep them separate. So here's a person. He's a really good guy. And he's got a good job. But he won't let his Christian faith affect his job. He doesn't tell his colleagues he's a Christian. He doesn't make a stand on Christian principles at work. And he certainly won't see his workplace as, as his mission field. No, that's his secular job. And then at half past five in the evening, he comes home and he sits with his family around the meal table and they bow their heads and he prays and he thanks God for the food and he thanks God for his home and prays for God's blessing upon them. And he plays with them. And then at bedtime, he takes them up to bed and he sits them on their bed and he sits on the bed and he reads them a Bible story. And then just before they go to sleep, he prays with them and prays that God will help them to be good little boys and to love their mummies and daddies and to do their schoolwork well. And he prays for them. And then he goes to sleep, he gets up the next day, and he goes to work. And there's nothing spiritual in his work at all. He keeps them completely separate. He comes to church on Sundays and he sings the songs and he brings his kiddies along and he sings with them and he sends them off to Sunday school and then he sits in the pew just like you are doing now. But then on Monday when he goes to work, no, he leaves all that behind. He has compartmentalized his life. God, you're allowed in this box, but you're not allowed in that box. That belongs to Caesar. 
Now this is even worse than the last era. The Pharisees, well they wouldn't have anything to do with secular politics because they thought that excluded God. But these people, they deliberately exclude God from a whole part of their lives. They say, we give to God what belongs to God, but that sees us. So we keep that for season. We keep God out of that part of our life. So God doesn't influence the videos they watch. And God doesn't influence the way they dispose of their excess wealth. And God doesn't uh, affect the way they do their jobs. And God doesn't uh, determine which girls they will go out with. No, God is for Sundays, for Christmas, for funerals and those kind of things. And so they make a massive separation in their lives. This is for God. This is not for God. It's for Caesar. And this misunderstanding has terrible consequences. Because some people feel challenged. They're in church on a Sunday and they feel they want to devote the whole of their life to God. They don't want to be compromised. They don't want to be superficial. They want to be totally committed to God. And so they think they've got to give up their job and become a missionary. Or they've got to give up their job and become a full-time youth worker or, 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 or a minister or something. But do you know that? Being a missionary is no more holy than teaching five-year-olds at the primary school, if you do it to the glory of God, if that's what God wants you to do. Or cold calling on the telephones for hour after hour, Monday to Friday. Or working down in the sewers. If God has called you to have a job as walking dogs, then if you walk dogs to the glory of God, that is just as spiritual as an evangelist preaching to 10,000 people. Because you are fulfilling your life the way God has made you, the way God has called you, you are doing God's will, and that's just as holy as anything else. So Billy Graham used to preach to thousands of people night after night, and his wife had a sign above the kitchen sink which said, divine service done here three times every day. As she did the washing up. Because washing up is just as holy as preaching the gospel. If you're doing it in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to him. Do you understand that? It was the old Roman Catholic era, wasn't it, that made a distinction between the clergy and the laity. The spiritual and the secular. So if you wanted to be spiritual, you went and became a nun. That's not true. There is no divide between the secular and the spiritual. But didn't Jesus say, render to Caesar the things that belong to Caesar, and to God the things that belong to God? Didn't Jesus say that? Yes. But think about it for a moment. What belongs to God? Everything belongs to God. Listen to Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's. How does it go on? and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. All right, so what belongs to God? Everything and everybody belongs to God. Indeed, Caesar belongs to God, and your job belongs to God, and your car belongs to God. Hmm. So if you give to God what belongs to God, what's left behind for Caesar? Nothing. So what did Jesus mean? Well, let's look at the correct understanding. First of all, notice what Jesus didn't say. Jesus didn't say, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to the temple the things that belong to the temple. Jesus was not making a distinction between church and state. This is why Jesus used the illustration of the coin. You remember the story. They ask, is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? And Jesus said, bring me a denarius and let me look at it. And so they search around and they find a denarius. It was a little silver coin. It was about the size of a 20p coin, except for it wasn't uh, with straight edges. Um, yeah, it was about the size of a 20p coin. It was a silver coin, but it was worth the equivalent today of... 60 pounds. So quite a lot of money, silver coin. And they search around and they manage to find one and they bring it to Jesus. And Jesus asks them a question. Jesus asks, whose portrait is this? 
and whose inscription? Literally, Jesus asked them, whose image is this? Whose image is on this coin? And whose inscription? And whose image is on the coin? Caesar's. Okay, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Well, what has God's image on it? Where is God's image? Look in the mirror. We are made in the image and likeness of God. God's image is on you. Do you understand what Jesus is saying? Your life is like that coin, except it has God's image on it. So give to God what belongs to God. Give him the whole of your life. Now, as someone who is totally devoted to God, you have responsibilities to live for God in this world. So you must do your job to the glory of God. So you obey your boss to the glory of God. And you must obey your parents to the glory of God. And you must be a godly citizen. So you must give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. You walk on Caesar's roads, you drink from Caesar's aqueducts, and so pay your taxes to Caesar. Today, we must pay our taxes and we must try and obey the speed limit and we must wear a seat belt when we're in the car and after the end of this month we mustn't smoke in any public place and you mustn't operation operate on your dog unless you have a qualification as a vet and you mustn't take frog spawn out of rivers unless you're going to put it in a proper uh, pond and you must pay your workers at least the minimum a uh, the minimum wage this is the law of the land and we must submit to it as part of our devotion to god where the whole of our life is dedicated to god part of it is to render to caesar what is due to caesar but what if it's a bad government like Tiberius Caesar's Rome, where Tiberius called himself divine and demanded uh, worship. Indeed, on his coins it would have his face and it would say, uh, Tiberius Caesar, son of the divine Augustus. And on the back it would say, high priest. Isn't that blasphemous? And when he used your taxes to fund gladiatorial contests, and even where Christians were thrown to the lions at taxpayers' expense. And when he paid his army to go and conquer any nation he could find. What? Pay taxes to Rome? Yeah. Yeah. It's God's will that there is government. Even bad government. So pay your taxes. Submit to the government. But what if the government tells you to disobey God? Well, you can't obey it then. Because your submission to the government is just a part of your devotion to God. Imagine that this pulpit is your life. And over here, this is your work. And over here, this is your family. And over here, this is your responsibilities as a citizen. But all of it, all of it is rendering to God what belongs to God. So if, if Caesar tells you to worship Caesar and not worship God, as, as um, in Nebuchadnezzar's day, they said, worship me, don't worship any other God. Well, then you say, I'm sorry. Because my obedience to the government is just a part of my worship of God. And when the government tells me not to worship God, to worship it, I have a simple reply. It is better to obey God than man. Just as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego wouldn't worship Nebuchadnezzar, and so they were thrown into the fiery furnace. So our submission to the state is a part of our life for God in this world. Basically, as Christians, we should be the best citizens in the country. Did you know that? We should be. 
But is there never a time to rebel? Well, we are to give Caesar what is due to Caesar. But when the government oversteps the limit, and when it demands what is not due to it, in other words, like in Nebuchadnezzar's day when it demands worship, then there is a time for civil disobedience. But that's not going to be the norm. The norm is that we fear God, honor the king, that we submit to the government, that we give respect to them, we give them honor, we give them revenue, we give them our taxes. We're the best citizens in the world. So if you woke up this morning and you turned your radio on and at 7 o'clock you find that you are under Roman occupation and they're demanding you to pay a poll tax so that they can afford to stay in England and rule you, do you pay the tax? Yes, you do. You pay your 3 million rubles. You might not like it, but that is only about 60 pounds a year. But you are not going to become a martyr for that. But if they tell you that you must not worship the Lord Jesus Christ, if they tell you that you're not allowed to read the Bible or teach it to your children, if they tell you you're not allowed to pray, well, then you will become a martyr for that. For you will give to Caesar what is Caesar's, but you give to God what is God's, and you belong to God because his image is on you. So let's remind ourselves now, once again, to give ourselves totally to God. Let's not come here and have our lives in different compartments. Well, here's our religious bit. Now let's make sure before we leave this place, we have recommitted our total devotion of the whole of our lives to God. This is the wonder of being made in the image of God. And you know, because we were made in the image of God, it was possible for God to become man and remain fully God. It's because we have the privilege of being made in the image of God that Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, was able to become a human being and be our representative and die to save us, to shed his blood for the forgiveness of our sins and he gave himself for us so what should our response be here i give myself to you totally absolutely not a compartment not a bit of my life not a sunday but the whole of my life i give to god what belongs to god and therefore as a servant of god i will give to caesar what belongs to caesar i give to my boss what belongs to my boss i'll give to my parents what belongs to my parents but my life is given to God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the immense privilege of being created in the image and likeness of God. And although sin has come in and that image has been uh, fallen, it's been um, depraved, we thank you that it remains. And we pray that we might live as citizens of heaven here on earth and that we might live as Jesus Christ would have us to live, that the whole of our lives would be devoted to you. We thank you for Jesus Christ who gave himself for us, who loved us and gave himself for us. We thank you that though he was fully God, He took upon himself the likeness of sinful flesh. And we pray that we might be totally devoted to him, that it will affect the way we do our jobs, the way we live in our homes, what we watch on the television, how we vote. May everything be done to your glory and honor. Amen. Well, let's sing about the Lord Jesus Christ. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong, a perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. Remember on the Roman denarius, it said that Tiberius was the high priest. Well, thankfully, Jesus Christ is the great high priest. Let's stand and sing.